In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Now I know what you're thinking. This is exactly why we don't talk about religion or politics at the dinner table. I was once facilitating a conversation about this passage when a young woman looked up and without a hint of humor said, I don't need Jesus to create conflict between me and my mother-in-law. It seems to come all by itself. But I'm going to try to persuade you that Jesus is not trying to break up the family. Jesus is trying to build up the capacity of the disciples to be in relationship. You will remember that at the time of the disciples and the early communities of Christians, the family was the source of all of your power, all of your wealth, all of your status, all of your opportunities. And yet Jesus seems to be saying that the family is not where you go to to find your identity. The family is the place you come from to discover your identity. It's not that the family isn't important. It's that your identity is that of a child of God. And if you can remember that, recognize that, live into that, then you will have a greater capacity to be in relationships with others who are also children of God. And yet Jesus seems to be saying, count the cost. This is not going to be as easy as you think. Just because you say it doesn't mean everyone else is going to be persuaded by it. Because you see, when we have our identity coming out of our family, to have somebody else let go of that is threatening. It is threatening to us. It is threatening to the family. And we will resist it naturally. We might even try to sabotage it. This happens all the time. The change that Jesus is encouraging the disciples to attempt is one that isn't complete until they have identified and learned to deal with resistance and sabotage. That's what Jesus is trying to say, I think. And in the end, the family will be stronger. The family will have greater purpose. The family will have greater meaning. You can see this, I think, in Jesus' own family. Right away with his father, Joseph, you can see a differentiation begin to occur. Joseph is engaged to this woman who is unexpectedly pregnant. You can only imagine what his family must have thought. There's a way to deal with this without our being shamed. And yet Joseph after hearing a voice in a dream calling him to take care of Mary, to love Mary, to protect Mary, does just that, differentiating himself perhaps from his family. And Mary, she's the other side of the same coin. She is not only finding herself unexpectedly pregnant, but she said yes to this. And she is not running from shame. She is bursting with joy. That's the feeling of that meeting with Elizabeth, her cousin who is also unexpectedly pregnant, from which we get the Magnificat. Mary sees herself as a handmaiden of the Lord, full of joy and excitement, a differentiation from traditional family structures. And then there's Jesus 
There are many, many stories of Jesus which as a parent just make you cringe. Remember the feast of Pentecost in Mark? Jesus is only 12 years old. They go to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. They finish, they pack up, they go home. Three days later, they look around, no Jesus. Mary and Joseph frantically go back to Jerusalem, search all around for him. They finally find him at the temple. And what do they say? How could you have done this to us? We've been anxiously searching everywhere. And Jesus says simply, where did you think I would be except in my father's house? And then there's another story later in Jesus's ministry when Mary and her brothers thinking Jesus to be out of his mind, show up to take charge of him. The disciples let him know that they are there, and Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Then with a sweep of his arm, indicating the group of disciples standing there, he says, you are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. All those who believe in God are my family. Jesus even says no to people who can't seem to distinguish themselves from their family. Remember the rich young ruler who Jesus clearly loved, yet unable to separate himself from his family wealth? Jesus sends him home. And then there is those ones where Jesus says, don't bury the dead, just follow me. As if to say, let the family take care of itself. Your first priority is your relationship with God. Now, this winds up creating an amazingly healthy and loving family. It is Mary who is there at the foot of the cross at the end. It is Brother James who sees the risen Christ, becomes the first bishop of Jerusalem, and is martyred for his faith. This is the message I think Jesus is trying to give his disciples. Your identity is not in your family with its power and status and opportunity. It is instead with God. But then you have to wonder, does this really have any meaning for us today? We don't kind of look at our families quite the same way. Should we worry about this passage at all? I think the answer to that question is another question. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? If someone came up to you and said, who are you? What would you say? You might start with where are you from, who your people are, what you do, where you've been, what you like. If the conversation went on a little bit more, you might share some more personal experiences. If any intimacy and trust developed, you might actually talk about your feelings. Some way along the way, you might have said something about what you believe, or more likely what you don't believe. And yet, are any of those things you? Or are they just descriptions of you? If you think about it, if any of those things were not there, or even different, you would still be you. You can tick down the list, taking one away, and then another, and another, and you are still there. So who are you? The Christian contemplative tradition says that you are the consciousness, the awareness, the perspective that exists when you strip all of those other identities away. You are the one who sees what you see, who feels what you feel who sees from a seat of consciousness. Meister Eckert even said, my eye that sees God is the eye of God that sees me. 
all of which is to say the presence of God is at our core. It is what Paul calls Christ consciousness, or what Jesus calls the kingdom of God, or what we often call the soul. And it is finding our identity rooted in the soul, which expands our capacity to be in relationship with others. It allows us to live into our family, not as a place that we go to to find our identity, but as a place we come from to discover our identity. And the kingdom of God depends upon it. We have an intuitive sense of this, I think. My 12-year-old stepson is at camp. We have been receiving all of these wonderful pictures of him skiing and diving and playing pickleball. And he wrote his mother a letter. And he said, if, if it wasn't for camp, I wouldn't be alive. And his mother said, I'm glad you're having a good time, but that's a little extreme. And he said, I'm just saying this is where you and dad met. In other words, we know what it's like to find our identity in something that isn't God. And yet what we're called to do in our pilgrimage of faith is to let go of those identities to find the presence of God in us and live out of that identity. Margaret Silf, one of my favorite writers, offers an image for this journey of faith, this pilgrimage of letting go. She describes herself in this dream as living in a wonderful, perfect stone cottage on the banks of a big, large river. She feels safe in her cottage. It's almost sacred space, identity creating even. It protects her from the elements, the predators that walk the shores. And yet she feels called. She feels called across the river to go to the other side. As if there's a promise, she will find herself there. But she doesn't know how to proceed. Trusting in that call, however, she steps off and she finds as she takes her first step a stone there in the river. She steps on that stone but doesn't know what to do next. As she pauses and feels the anxiety build up, it feels like God is there putting another stone in front of her. And so trusting in God, she takes a step onto that stone. And this continues one step after another until she gets to the middle of the river. And in the middle of the river, she has the courage to look back over her shoulder. One last look, she thinks, at her beloved cottage, the home that was, the identity that she thought was her. And there she sees Jesus dismantling her cottage, stone by stone, as he brings a stone out into the river, and it becomes her next step. When Jesus says, find your identity in God, and not in all of the other things the world offers, he is promising us that God will be there in this pilgrimage. It's not that we have to discard the parts of our life that were before. We just reorganize them, transfigure them, so that they become the stones, that we march toward an unimaginable future. And we do that by trusting in God, that God will be there putting those stones as we need them for each step. Amen.